IB Nation, welcome back to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. It's Thursday, March 14th. Got a fun show uh, ready for you all today. I think it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to talking about it. I'm curious to see if you guys are looking forward to talking about it. Going to dive into three different topics today. And and the first two are going to be a little bit, you know, those topics that you kind of look at and say, hey, these... um, these are kind of not really complementary of, of each other. Actually, they're they're kind of opposites of each other. And, and but th- the reality is, is both areas are going to have a big impact on what happens with Notre Dame this year. And that's something that I'm very much looking forward to seeing. Uh, and the first topic is going to be a youth movement that Notre Dame is getting ready to go through and is going to deal with this season. And you're in a situation with the Irish where you know you've seen some v- really veteran teams win championships in recent years. Obviously, Michigan this past year was an extremely veteran team. And Notre Dame's going to have plenty of veteran experience and, and plenty of veteran stars, which I'll talk about during that intro to that show. But if Notre Dame's really going to take off as a program, they're going to need their young players to step up. They're going to need the sophomore class, the freshman class to really step up. And and if you want to get technical with the way other teams evaluate players, it even, it's even more young players when you start looking at redshirt sophomores. And so we're going to dive into that and how important those players are to Notre Dame and just what some of my expectations are for those players this spring. And and the fact that, you know, this is a spring focused show because we need to see that improvement this spring. We need to see those players kind of start taking that jump this spring. And I'm, I'm going to dive into that and it's, it's starting lineup, it's depth. I mean, there's going to be a lot of young players in position to battle this spring, which in some areas is not good. In some areas is good. And I'll talk about that as well. Part two of today's show is going to look at the veterans. It's sort of a, you know, I used to call it last chance you when that was a thing. I don't know if that's a thing anymore. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen that. But, you know, that that last chance for some veteran players to really say, hey, now's my time to shine. Because if I don't if I do not do play well now, if I don't step up now, I'm not going to get another shot because there's just so many small play, so many younger players uh, behind me that are battling for jobs. And so we'll, we'll break those players down. There's a small handful of those guys that I think are entering that type of situation. And then the final topic I'm going to look at today is going to be diving into the latest with the college football playoff, uh, what we're hearing, and how masterfully the Big Ten and the SEC played this whole thing. And I'm going to dive into that as well. I'm not happy about it, and I think it's ridiculous, but you also have to cut, sometimes give credit where credit is due. They had an end game in mind. They asked for something, knowing what they really wanted, and they got what they wanted. So we'll dive into that as well at the end. Topic number one, however, is the youth movement that is happening at Notre Dame. And I'm going to break it down kind of into two sections. I'm going to first start talking about the offense and then the defense, but they're all going to kind of go together as one show. That's really where the emphasis is going to be. And when you look at Notre Dame this season and you look at where this football team is, Obviously, there's veteran players all over the place. I mean, the guys that Notre Dame is going to be building around this year, they're going to have a senior quarterback. They're going to have a senior tight end, not in the spring, but when we get to the fall. You've got veterans at different – Jaden Thomas, Deion Coles, who I'm going to talk about later in different at different times. You have Chris Mitchell transferred in as a six-year senior. Jaden Harrison came in as a senior. Bo Collins will be here in the fall uh, as a senior who's played a lot of football. You look up front, you know, you got two juniors that are battling for jobs. You've got a fifth year senior battling for a job. Uh, but but really guys that have established themselves are, you know, the quarterback. Defensively is really where you see a lot of the, the veterans that you can build around. You've got Benjamin Morrison, who's a junior, who's now a three year starter, been an All American. You've got Xavier Watts, fifth year senior, unanimous All American last year. You've got Jack Kaiser, six year senior, fully expect him to be a team captain this year. You get Jordan Clark in from Arizona State, six-year senior, a guy that's been a captain in the past. And you look up front, Riley Mills, fifth-year senior, multi-year starter. You look at Howard Cross you know, with his second-team All-American um, output last year as a six-year senior. R.J. Oban, sixth-year senior. Jordan Patelho, fifth-year senior. So there's a lot of veteran players that Notre Dame is going to be able to build around. and But at the same time, there there were some recruiting misses and some recruiting classes that have created a bit of a void in between. 
And one of those areas was in the the class that, uh, you know, the, the 2020 and 2021 classes have created some issues, or t- excuse me, 2021, 2020, 2021, and 2020 classes, or 22 classes. And the reason for that is, is because you had some years where Notre Dame was short on numbers. And, and, and in those years, you've had some departures from those rosters. You've also had some years where, you know, Notre Dame came up short in some some key areas and you know had to settle for smaller numbers and or had guys that where they missed out on certain positions where they were short on certain positions and and Notre Dame has kind of come up short in some veteran players at certain at certain spots. And you look at the secondary, for example, and you say, hey, look, I mean, the last couple of years you've had Cam Hart and Xavier Watts. Well, them playing secondary hurt the receiving core because those guys were recruited to play receivers. So you look at the 2000, uh, the 2020 class which are the fifth year seniors, they only had 17 guys to begin with. They came up woefully short at a lot of positions. Jordan Johnson's gone. Jay Brunel is gone. Michael Mayer's gone. Chris Tyree is gone. Drew Pine is gone. Michael Carmody's gone. You've got um, Kevin Bauman's playing, but he's he's been inju- he's been injury prone. Aiden Kanaan is gone. Alexander Ahrensberger is gone. Caleb Offord is gone. Ramon Henderson is gone. And Alex Pike is gone. So when you look at fifth year seniors, that's a pretty small number. Then you fast forward to the 2021 class, which was the last full cat class that Brian Kelly landed, and they signed 27 kids. But there was a lot of kids that they signed in that class that you look back and you're like, "Yeah, I don't." That one didn't make a lot of sense, and a lot of those guys are gone, right? So you know, obviously Lorenzo Styles is gone, Kane Barong is gone. Some of these guys are gone because they got beat out. Audric Estime is gone; he's in the NFL. Logan Diggs transferred. Tyler Buckner had his woes. Blake Fisher's off to the NFL. Joe Alt hit. Grand Slam, he's gone. Caleb Johnson transferred. Prince Prince Colley transferred. Joshua Bryant was a kicker, has transferred. Will Schweitzer has transferred. Devin Upow transferred pretty quickly. Justin Walters has transferred. Ryan Barnes has transferred. Philip Riley's transferred. JoJo Johnson's transferred. And Kari G transferred. And then when you look at the first full, the first, the last class that was the the Brian Kelly, Marcus Freeman class you know you have some strengths from that class and some we're going to talk about some of those players but you also have in a situation where you know you only signed one receiver that year and he's gone Tobias Merriweather he transferred or Holden Stace transferred your offensive line class had four guys or five guys one of them Joey Tonona had an unfortunate injury that cost him his career at Notre Dame fortunately Joey's bounced back enough to where he's going to get a chance to play at Purdue and I'm pulling like crazy for that kid your offensive line class worked out. You you know three of your four linebackers are still here. Oh, you know, your defensive line class. You signed three defensive linemen. They're all here. You signed th- only three DBs. One of them is gone. So you had some positions where you came up short on numbers and you've had departures. So what that's done is that's thrust Notre Dame into a situation where you are forced to rely a lot on your younger players and transfers. And that's the sit- unique situation Notre Dame is in because. It's sort of a twofold way of looking at it. One is, why is Charles Jagasaw going to start at left tackle, for example? Well, one is, he's really good. Two is, who else is going to start at left tackle? And and you have that in, in a lot of different positions, in a lot of different situations, partly because of things worked out well. You're going to have youth at running back and at left tackle because you had a star at those two positions who left early for the NFL. That's a good thing for them to have, but the recruiting woes that they've had in the past have led them to situations where now you're having to replace those guys with much younger players. That's the concern. And obviously Notre Dame was forced to go to the portal again this year in certain areas. The flip side of that, and this is really what we're going to talk more about today, is the fact that, yes, Notre Dame has to play a lot of young players. In one position in particular, they have nothing but redshirt sophomores or younger which we'll dive into, but it's a position where I'm probably more excited about that position and more confident in that position than I am any, maybe any position on the team, certainly on, on the offensive side of the ball. And, and this is where, as we've talked about, this is, this is the season where we start to find out just how good Marcus Freeman and Chad Bowden really are. Because this is the year where you're forced to play a lot of younger guys but those younger guys are part of Marcus Freeman's first full two classes. Classes that I've talked about have, have rank have more. So people talk about, oh, this class isn't wasn't any better than Kelly's classes. Well, what do you base that off of? Well, this class ranked eighth or tenth or eleventh, and it's kind of where Kelly ranked. And I've pointed out 
this class is significantly better than classes that Brian Kelly's had uh, in, during his career. Brian Kelly had, I think, 12 full classes. Only the 13 class had more points, according to 247 Sports or Rivals, than what the 23 and 24 classes had. Only the 2013 class had more had a higher per player ranking average than the 23 and the 24 classes. And so to me, when I look at 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 where Notre Dame is and 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 what they're capable of of being this season, it's a situation where we're gonna see real quickly just how how impactful this recruiting operation is. The good news is, is that, yes, they're going to have to play a lot of young players. But as I go through this list today, what you're going to find with almost no exceptions of guys that are going to be starting or pushing for starting, yes, they're kind of ha- they kind of have to be in that situation, but they're ready and the talent is exceptional. And now we're going to find out if this coaching staff can develop those players and get them where they need to be because that honestly – the veterans are what they are. They're very good players, very excited about what they can bring to the table. I think they're going to have very good seasons. But at the end of the day, this whole operation is going to be determined whether whether Notre Dame is a good team, a 10-2, and two, you know, good football team that maybe makes the playoffs as a lower seed or is playing in a, in a, in a bowl game with the chance to go 11-2, you know, quality season, or – is this a team that can kind of take that next step, be an 11-plus win team in the regular season, go to the playoff, and not just be happy to be there, yay, we made the playoff, but be in a situation where they have a chance to do some damage. And if that's going to happen, yes, the veterans need to keep doing what they're doing. And some of the newcomer veterans like Riley Leonard and R.J. Oban and, and Rod Hurd and Chris Mitchell and Bo Collins, you hope that those guys have an impact. But at the end of the day, it's it's how much of this youth movement that they're going to have to go through is able to step up and perform. And how well that group takes handles things and takes over is going to go a long way towards determining just how good this football team can be. If you all give me one second, I'm going to take myself out of here, plug this thing in, and I'll be right back. Just give me one second. It's kind of funny. I go through this like checklist before I start a show. It's like, okay, I've got this, I've got that, I've got the lights on, I've got the thing set up, I've got my notes, I've got the microphone plugged in, I've got all these things. And I forget to com- plug in the computer. And unfortunately, I have a very old, very old lap, uh, I'm Mac MacBook Pro that is uh, pretty old and can't make it through a whole show unless it's plugged in. <laughs> so from the intro to now, which is only 14 minutes, I went from 97% to 76%. So I was like, yeah, I think I need to go ahead and get this thing plugged in before I get started. So I appreciate y'all's patience and and I'm ready to get back to it and, and dive into this and have some fun talking about this. Now, when you discuss the youth movement at Notre Dame, both sides of the ball are going to be impacted. Both sides of the ball need young players to step up. And I'm first going to kind of start off with sophomores and freshmen and then also incorporate some redshirt freshmen in this conversation as well. But I, I, I like sticking to more looking at it from the standpoint of, of true youth, you know, first and second year players. Because, you know, redshirt sophomores are, are still guys that are going into their third year. I don't count most of them as young at this point in time. But when I look at the offense and the defense and the difference, there are some guys that kind of have to step up on defense. But honestly, outside of maybe one of 11 spots, Notre Dame doesn't need a sophomore to really step up and thrive. On offense, 
you need, if you're looking at just freshmen and sophomores, you need at least, in my opinion, two guys to really step up, at least two, and I would argue four or five. And that's one of the really big differences. And the good news is that there's a lot of the, the talent at Notre Dame on the offensive side is really good. And that's where we're going to start. And and the first place to start is at the skill positions. You know, when when you look at this Notre Dame football team on offense and you start thinking about, you know, what excites you about 2024, the season. And, and of course, you know, I, I don't know about where you guys are, but but I'm excited about what Riley Leonard is going to bring to the table. And I'm I'm very excited about, you know, Landon Chris Mitchell and and Jaden Thomas and 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 Bo Collins and Deion Colsey and Mitchell Evans and a lot of those type of guys. But when I start really getting excited about this group, it's it's that those players who are good players and in some instances potentially standout players are going to be complemented by so many young players that have really just a ton of talent. Like I think Chris Mitchell could be very good at Notre Dame. I think Riley Leonard has a chance to be a star at Notre Dame. I think Mitchell Evans can be one of the five best tight ends in the country next year if he's healthy. But when you look at it and say, well, that, that's really good, that can get you to 10 and 2, but is that good enough to get you 11 and 11 and 1, 12 and 0? Is that good enough to help you get in a run in the playoff? Maybe. I don't think it is, though, because of the importance of other positions. And when you look at the skills, skill positions, especially, there's some younger players that really have a chance to be stars. And, and, there's one particular red shirt, couple red shirt sophomores that I'm going to talk about in this group because, or one in this group and then one in line, because they're they're red shirt sophomores, but they missed a lot of time, so they didn't have the advantage of of what other third year players have, uh, and, and it really begins at running back. And and when you look at the the backfield, and, and I mentioned this earlier, there's a position where you're really young, and and when you look at the running back room. Every player at running back now that Devin Ford's at safety is a redshirt sophomore or younger. Jadarian Price and Jabron Payne are redshirt sophomores. You have Jeremiah Love, who's a sophomore. And then you have two freshmen in Kedron Young and Aeneas Williams. And this position is absolutely – I mean, you're going to have a sophomore or a redshirt sophomore starting at running back this year. Your depth chart is going to be made up entirely of redshirt sophomores, sophomores, or freshmen. And while Jabron Payne is not your typical, is more of your typical redshirt sophomore, I don't think Jadarian Price is. And so I'm going to actually include Jadarian in this conversation because he did miss his entire freshman season with the Achilles injury. So when you look at what we're placing all of our hopes on the running back room being as far as being an elite unit, potentially elite unit, a good a unit good enough to take Notre Dame to the college football playoff, you need the youth movement to really take hold at that position. You start with Jeremiah Love, who's a true sophomore. You're talking about a guy that last season had a good first year at Notre Dame. You know, had, had a thing started off well for his rookie year, was second on the team in rushing last season with 385 yards. Uh, didn't make as much of an impact as the, in the past game as I had hoped he would be. Big part of it was because of how he was used. But we did see him get a chance late in the season uh, to make a couple plays in the past game. But you know, he's a guy that, that last season had, uh, when you look at just total offense, when you include rushing, receiving, kick return yards, had 504 yards. Uh, when you look at his total offense production or yards from scrimmage, he had 462 yards on only 79 plays, had two touchdowns, 5.8 yards per touch. Good, good season, good first season. So he got a chance to get his feet wet. Well, now that he goes into year two, he's got a chance to be a stud. And, you've, and, and you're going to need him to do that. At the same time, Jadarian Price is in the similar boat. Jadarian obviously missed. It's funny, I wrote about, I wrote about this in my, in my uh, breakouts article today, about, which was about the topic that I discussed in yesterday's show. And I forgot to mention this in, in yesterday's show, but and I've mentioned this to you guys before, but you know, we everybody talks about how how good Jeremiah Love was last year, but we forget that that Jadarian Price averaged five point eight yards per, ca per per carry, and Jeremiah was at five point four. And I remember talking to an assistant coach at Notre Dame after the spring of two thousand and twenty two. This is before Jadarian in Price's injury, but he said, "Listen, our best running back all spring was Jadarian Price. He's got a chance to start for us." This is a backfield that had Audric Estime and Logan Diggs and Chris Tyree at the time. That's how good he was that spring. Now, would that have manifested that way in the season? Who knows? But that's what a lot of people were talking about. Well, then he had the Achilles injury and missed his entire freshman season. Last year was his first year back from that, and he showed a lot of promise. And obviously, as I mentioned before, 5.8 – because we always talk about how explosive Jeremiah Love is, and he absolutely is. 
And Jeremiah Love has a, way, a million impact the game the way a lot of other people don't, and, and I'll get into that. But when you when you look at this backfield, you cannot forget about Jadarian Price. You're talking about a kid that averaged 5.8 yards per carry. You're talking about a kid that had five catches for 65 yards and a touchdown. And you're talking about a young man that averaged 34.4 yards per kick return last season. Notre Dame just landed a first-team All-American kick returner in Jaden Harrison, who averaged 30 yards per kick return at the group of five level. And, and he was very good. Don't get me wrong. He was a very good kick returner. And he had over twice as many kick return opportunities as, J- as Jadarian did. And most likely, if Jadarian would have doubled his, his opportunities, maybe he stays around 34. But Chris, uh, Jaden Harrison was at 30.7 yards per kick return last season, had two touchdowns, and was a guy that earned first-team All-American honors as a kick returner, you look at the the last year, the, the leader in, in kick returns last season was Barry and Brown from Kentucky. He averaged 36 yards per return. Number two was Jaden Harrison, who was at 30.7. Those are the only two guys last year that had enough had enough returns to qualify uh, to, to that were over 30 yards. Jadarian Price had 34.4. So he was a really talented impact player. And now he's a year removed from the injury potential for big time impact. You look at Jeremiah Love. Big time talent, big time potential. And the thing I love about that group, and, and and this is what I wrote about also today in that article, is you you want back comp, you want two your top two backs to be a combination of they can do a lot of the same things, but they complement each other. And that can be hard to do because, like with Logan Diggs, Diggs and Audric Estimate two years ago, they they had different strengths and weaknesses, but as far as how they fit into the offense, they were the same guy. When you put Logan in the game, you didn't really change your anything. When you put Audric in the game, you didn't really change anything. They 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 ran the same offense. And to a degree, you want that. You want to have – you don't want to have to – so you don't want to be in a situation where when Jadarian's in the game, your inside zone duo counter, that's all you run because that's all he can run. He can't. I'm making a point. You don't want to be in a situation where Jeremiah Love, when he's in a game, you're only running outside zone, buck sweep, and inside zone because that's all they can do. Because what happens is, is by the time you get to Louisville, they're going to have some tells. By the time you get to Florida State, they're going to have a lot of tells. They're going to know when this guy's in the game, when that guy's in the game, this is what we're going to be the calls we're going to be making because this is what they do. You know, when number four is in the game, they run buck sweep, outside zone, inside zone, and they'll throw the ball to them. We, 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 here's where our calls are going to be. When 24 is in the game, they're downhill power runs. This is what we're this is how we're going to play it. The nice thing is that both of those guys can run everything. They both can run downhill. Jeremiah can run inside zone. Jadarian can run inside zone. Both of those guys are, are, are uh, able to run duo. They're both able to make plays on counter. They can both run outside zone. They can ro- both run buck sweep. They can both take a toss and either outrun the defense of the sideline or, or stretch, 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 boom, hit it vertically behind the offensive line. They can do all of those things. At the same time, there are enough differences in, in how they go about it that it's not the same dude. The other part of it, though, is because their skill set is very different, is that they don't, they, they also complement each other. Because they can run everything, but I really like Jadarian even more so on the downhill runs. Jadarian can bounce it. He can make people miss. We saw it last year. He can do all those things, but, man, I can't wait to see him. I mean, just first carry of the season, we saw it. Just downhill, I believe it was a duo call. Just boom, vertical, exploded through the line against Navy, touchdown. And, of course, we saw Jeremiah's first touchdown was getting outside, getting in space, making people miss, boom, touchdown. Well, Jadarian can do that. But he's at his best when he is one cut, get downhill, and go. And and so with Jeremiah, he while although he can do those things, there's also some things you want to get him involved in that's more perimeter oriented, where it's straight perimeter oriented, whether it's screen game, you know, buck sweeps, outside zone, toss, reverses. He can do a lot of those things that you want to take advantage of. And he's such a unique pass game weapon that you want to be able to take advantage of that too. And, and Jadarian, as we saw last year, can be effective in the pass game, but he's effective in the pass game in more of the traditional stuff, check downs, um, angle routes out of the backfield, swing routes out of the backfield, you know, slide routes out of the backfield, you know, the occasional wheel route. He can run a, a seam concept out of the backfield. But everything that you're going to do for, with Jadarian outside of some perimeter screen stuff, 
is going to be straight out of the backfield and, and more as traditional running back type of route. With Jeremiah, you can still do all those things, but Jeremiah is a 6'1", 195, fast kid that can catch the ball that began his high school career playing receiver. He can actually line up and, and run routes. I mean, he can run slants. He can run goes. He can run crosses, overs, things like that, sales, where you can do some really unique stuff with him that you can't that you can't really do with Jadarian that allows you to threaten teams in a different way. The, the great part about that, however, is that they complement each other. You have to compare, you have to prepare for a lot of different things with those two backs, but you're not going to be able to get as many of the run game tells that you normally get from two complementary backs who, who are different type of runners. The other part I like about it is with those two kids that are young players is you have a chance to use them together. And, and, that's an exciting thing, but we get back to this being a youth movement. And the reality is we know those guys can be quality backups. They were quality backups last year. But the unknown is can they be stars? Can they be leading backs? Can they be the leading men in this offense? And that we don't know. And that's ultimately where we're going to be with a lot of this because the town is great, but there's still uncertainty because nobody that's young that's got a chance to be in a certain role this year has been in that role before for any extended period of time. Yes, it was great in the bowl game to watch Jadarian and Jeremiah tear up Oregon State, who was missing half their defense, right? But it doesn't mean a whole lot. It was great to see Charles Jagasaw and and, and Billy Shrouth and Ashton Craig performing well in that game. But that was against a team that was that was depleted, and you have to be able to look at that. Having these two players just alone – gives you a chance to have a dynamic offense, especially when you consider having Riley Leonard a quarterback. But there's more. You look outside, and we think about the impact that last year's freshman class had at receiver and, and thought that, you know, Rico Flores is gone, Braylon James is gone. That class lost a little bit, little bit of its shine from what we thought it was going to be on signing day. But when you look at the fact that Jordan Faison is now part of that group, you're getting K.K. Smith now part of that group after he missed all of last year. Your sophomore class is still really good with Jordan, Jaden Greathouse, Jordan Faison, and to a degree, K.K. Uh, K. Smith. Jordan Faison and Jaden Greathouse are both battling for a starting job to a degree with each other, but also you can use them on the field together. I mean, the, the biggest play that Jaden Greathouse had last season, biggest from a distance, not necessarily biggest from most important, I would argue the NC State touchdown was his most important play. But biggest as far as yardage was the the forty plus yard touchdown that he caught against against um, Wake Forest. Well, the interesting thing about that particular play is his is they had actually Jordan Jaden Greathouse and Jordan Faison were on the field together on that play. You actually had J Jordan Faison was your backside receiver on that play, ran a post clear, and that opened up the opportunity for Jordan Faison, Jordan Gre Jaden Greathouse to get across the field and catch that touchdown. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's going to be a long year with these receivers because you've got Jaden Greathouse, Jaden Harrison, Jaden Thomas, Jordan Faison. It's going to be a lot of uh, stuttering on my part trying to get the Jadarian Price, Jeremiah Love, a lot of J's. So forgive me when I when I don't quite get it right. But when you look at, at Jordan Faison and Jaden Greathouse, they can play together as well. And when you look at the production they had last year, I mean, they were both rookie standouts at, at different times of the season. Neither guy was good all year. Jordan Faison didn't play until the seventh game of the year, uh, played or the uh, sixth game of the year, played the final seven, caught 19 passes for 322 yards, 17 yards catch, four touchdowns, was second on the team and uh, tied for second on the team in receiving touchdowns. Who was he behind? Jaden Greathouse, who caught 18 touchdowns for 265 yards, or 18 passes for 265 yards and 14.7 yards per catch, had five receiving touchdowns last season. So nine of your 31 touchdown catch catches last year were by these two players. And so there's obviously a lot of excitement about what they can be. And they're part of that sort of that youth movement. And I still believe that you're in a situation where Jordan Faison is, is can just, if he can just do what he did last year for an entire season, you're good. And I don't know how much better Jordan Faison's going to get. I think he's going to get from the standpoint, he'll get more refined. He'll get, you know, be, become a better route runner. But I don't I don't know that he's a guy that you look at and say he's going to be – I've heard people comparing to Golden Tate. You know, is he going to have the kind of production Golden Tate has? I don't know about that. But honestly, I don't care. If he does, great. If he just repeats what he did last year for four years, three more years, I'm good with that. 
And 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 but with Great House, it's an interesting one because I really feel like had he not gotten hurt and moved to the boundary when Jaden Thomas got hurt, I think we'd be looking at Jaden Greathouse right now as fans a whole lot different than we do now. I mean, it, when, when I talk to people about the receiving core, you know, you hear a lot about Chris Mitchell, understandably. Bo Collins, totally get it. Jaden Harrison, totally get it. You hear people talk about Jaden Thomas is going to be that breakout. You hear about how great Jordan Faison is, and that's all great. And and I think all those guys have a chance to be that player, but I don't hear as much about Jaden Greathouse anymore, except, from, of course, from our guy, Salty Virginia Peanuts, who talks about him all the time. But I really believe that Jaden Greathouse, and I talked about this yesterday, I don't need to repeat myself, but I really believe Jaden Greathouse has a chance to be the best receiver on this on this team, not, not down the road in 2024. Can he be that guy? I don't know. Do they need him to be that guy? No, they don't. What they need him to be, however, is a, is a better version of what he was last season. That's the key. And so when you look at those two kids, you throw K.K. Smith, Smith in there, this sophomore class can complete this, this overhaul. But it's not just the sophomores. And then, of course, with Jadari being a redshirt sophomore, there's the freshman class has a chance to make their presence felt as well. You know, Kedron Young is one of the more gifted, just natural runners that Notre Dame has signed in a long time. You're talking about a 230-pound kid that can that can run, a 230-pound kid with great feet, a 230-pound kid with really good vision, a 230-pound kid that was out there catching go routes and wheel routes and seam routes in his first practice at Notre Dame like he was a slot receiver. He's a very talented kid. You've got Aeneas Williams, who in his career had over 4,000 rushing yards and 3,000 receiving yards and over 150 touchdowns in his career. And then, of course, at receiver, you've got Cam Williams and Micah Gilbert, who are exceptionally talented players and are going to battle. So when you look at the skill positions between Price, Love, I don't count Jabron Payne here because Jabron is a, is a redshirt sophomore that was healthy his entire freshman year, so he's more of a traditional redshirt sophomore. I'm looking more at the guys that, that really only have two years under their belt or less. And since Jadarian missed his whole freshman year, he is in that category. But Jadarian, Jeremiah, Kedron, Jaden Greathouse, Jordan Faison, K.K. Smith, Cam Williams, Micah Gilbert, that freshman and sophomore class is not only very talented, but they're in a position where Notre Dame needs at least, I would say not, not at least, they need – about half of those guys slightly under to really emerge between love and price and young. They need at least one of those guys to really step up and perform at a high level. And at least another one of those guys to be a good player this year, they have to have it. Notre Dame can't be the offense. We want them to be, or they need to be without one of those backs. One of the, the ones we discussed breaking out as a star and another one of those young backs that are talented of being a good player a good complimentary player. I love Jabron Payne. I've told you all in the past, I think Jabron could be a thousand yard rusher if you need him, but there's, there's different types of production. There's production where you're a good back. You, you help us win games. And then there's a production that's, that's game changing. Jabron can be a productive player at Notre Dame. Love Jabron Payne, but price and love are a little different in that you have to defend, you have to game plan for them completely different than you do Jabron Payne, where Jabron Payne is, is a really, He's like, uh, you know, the, the the machine is really good, and he's just a, and he's behind there, just bam, hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. And he's a good football player. Then there's guys that drive it, and Price can drive it, Love can drive it, Kedron can drive it. Will that be this year? They need at least one of those guys to be that guy this year. Then a receiver, like, okay, could Notre Dame be pretty good at receiver with Deion Colsey, Jaden Thomas, Bo Collins, Jaden Harrison? And Chris Mitchell all being the rotation. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good receiving core. I think that receiving core has got a chance to be to be one of the better ones the Notre Dame's had since 20, 2018. You know, when you look at the talent they have. But can they be a, a receiving core that is good enough to go into the postseason and play with the Georgias and the Ohio States and the Bamas and the Texases and teams like that if you don't have at least two – of Great House, Faison, K.K. Smith, Cam Williams, or Micah Gilbert step up. And I would especially point to the trio of Great House, Faison, and Cam Williams. And so we spent a lot of time on the two, the two sophomores. But 
I think Jaden Greathouse is probably the team's best overall receiver. It's between him, Mitchell, and Jaden Thomas. I would lean towards Mitchell and Jaden because I think those two are Jaden Greathouse because I think those two are a little bit faster. But when I look at it and I and I and I talk and I break it down, Greathouse might be their most gifted receiver from the standpoint of the whole package, route running, ball skills, football IQ athleticism all that but when you talk about who's the most dynamic talent at receiver I don't think it's close it's Cam Williams now how ready will Cam Williams be that's a that's a that's a that's the question right that's where we are when I watch Cam Williams in high school I mean you guys know it I had him as a five-star player it can't get much better than that Adam is a top 25 talent and when you get a chance to see him in person you see the explosiveness you see the ball skills. He had some drops in his first practice, mainly because he was thinking. You can see it. He's got some suddenness to him. The thing that surprised me about Cam when I watched him in that first practice, however, was how big he was. I didn't realize how big. I mean, he's a legit 6'2", maybe even a little slightly taller. He's a legit 200 plus pounds now. And you're like, good Lord, I had this kid as a five star and he's already bigger and a little taller and a little bit, even a little bit more initial burst more than I thought he had. And you get excited about that. So what, what does this offense look like this year? And I'll pose this to you guys in the chat. You tell me what you think. If Jaden Greathouse is the breakout player I predicted him to be, if Jordan Faison at the very least matches the level of play he did last year and then just has your normal year two growth, or Jordan F Jaden Greathouse has normal year two growth and J Jordan Faison has a breakout season, if one of those, if those two things happen with either guy, don't really care which one. And Cam Williams is a is a freshman that can come in and play for you right now. What are your feelings? And then you throw in Jeremiah Love and Jadarian Price or everything we think that they can be. If those things all happen, what do you guys think this offense looks like this year? What is your opinion of what the offense looks like this year? For me, when I look at that, if Price and Love and Keedron Young, if two of those three step up and are what we think they can be, if 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 Great House and Faison, one of them breaks out, one just makes normal second year growth, and if Cam Williams can be a 20 plus catch guy on this offense, 15, 20 plus catch guy on this offense, I mean, we're talking about Notre Dame having a chance to really, really be special from a skill talent standpoint. But there's got to be more. You got to have somebody blocking. You can have all the skill talent in the world, but when you get to the postseason, there's going to be some teams, Ohio State, Georgia, that are good enough to say, yeah, you have great talent, but we can at least match you or come close to matching you. But the reason you're not going to beat us is because we're going to beat you up in the trenches. And that's happened in Notre Dame in the past. That's why the youth movement is not only for the skill players. You've talked about Cooper Flanagan who's a true sophomore is going to be a very important part of the rotation this year. That's another young player, but I, and he's a guy to me that gets talked about more so in this category, because although I think Cooper can help you in the pass game, I think Cooper's got a chance to be a pretty darn good tight end at Notre Dame, but you know, he can run block at a high level, but more so there's two players I have in mind that I, that I'm really keying on. And, and one is Charles Jagasaw and the other is Billy Shrouth. I won't spend a lot of time talking about them because I talked about them a lot yesterday. Now, Billy Shrout is a redshirt sophomore, but he's also a guy that missed a lot of time as a rookie because of injury. But when you talk about Charles Jagasaw, can Notre Dame really be the team that we think they can be that goes on a run if Charles Jagasaw doesn't take a big step forward and break out as a sophomore? Can they be that team if they don't if Billy Shrout doesn't figure it out, put it all together, and step in and be that kind of player? Can they really be that kind of team? If you want to really get in, you know, Ashton Craig's another redshirt sophomore. And then you look at the two deep, there's a pretty good chance that there's going to be one true sophomore in the starting lineup for Notre Dame on the offensive line. And there's three true sophomores that are probably going to be in the two deep, at least two when you look at Sullivan Absher, Sam Pendleton, and Joe Otting. So you're talking about a very young group. And then you've got two redshirt sophomores that have a chance to start as well in, in Ashton Craig and Billy Shrouth. So a lot of times the, the, the focus is on the, the skill players that are young. And that's where you are confident that young players can step up. 
it's not always ideal when you have a bunch of younger linemen that are having to, to be dependent upon. And that's that's still where I get to my big concern with this offense is that right there. If you want to know what my biggest concern is, it's that they are a young offensive line. Jagasaw is a true sophomore. Uh, Absher, not Absher, excuse me. Um, Billy Shrouth and Ashton Craig are redshirt sophomores, but they only have three starts in their careers under their belt. They're still young players from a developmental standpoint. And then you talk about the two deep is going to be littered with young players. Sullivan Absher is going to be in the two deep at offensive tackle. If if he's not overtaken by Gearby Lambert, uh, or he moves inside and Gearby steps into that, who's a true freshman, who's an absolute uh, in- incredible talent. Sam Pendleton's going to be very hard to keep out of the two deep. He might be hard to keep out of the lineup, period, but he's definitely going to be hard to keep out of the two deep. And Joe Odding's going to is already your number two to number two center. And as I mentioned with Sullivan Absher, Sullivan Absher could be your number two left tackle. He could be your number two right tackle. He'd be one of your number two guards. Very, very talented player. But youth at the offensive line is not always this is not often the same as youth at the skill positions. Can these young players as a group, especially the guys that are going to be bound for starting jobs, can they grow up hurry in a hurry? That's the big question. Because I I think if 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 what I proposed earlier about the offensive skill talent, the young skill talent doing what it did, and then just, you know, Thomas and Mitchell and those guys are just solid. You've got Mitchell Evans. They got a shot to be really explosive on offense, 40 plus point per game team. But if that's not because, and the reason I say that is, is because at that point in time, it doesn't really matter a lot what the line does because this skill talent alone will allow them to go rip up Miami of Ohio and Northern Illinois and Purdue and, and Stanford and Virginia and Georgia Tech to a degree and Navy and Army and probably score a decent amount of points on USC. But if this team wants to go out and truly be a contender, go on the road and beat Texas A&M, beat Florida State at home, beat Louisville home, and then go into the postseason and be able to play with Georgia and play with the Buckeyes and play with Texas, then the line it's even more important that the line grows up. Because here's the second thing that I'll propose to you. What gives Notre Dame a better chance to be a great t- offense next year that Love and Price and Great House and Faison and Cam Williams all have breakouts, but the line, the young line is really inconsistent all season. It's number one or, or scenario number two, where the young guys are just okay. It's the veterans that dominate, you know, Price and Payne at lo- running back or, or, or Love and Price just make normal growth. The receivers don't really make that jump. Cooper doesn't necessarily make a jump. You're relying on Mitchell Evans and Chris Mitchell and Deion Colsey and Jaden Thomas and Jaden Harrison and guys like that. The other young guys give you depth. But in that scenario, Jagasaw, Absher, and Shrouth all are exactly what we think they're going to be or can be, and they're big-time players. Which scenario gives you greater confidence you can go beat Georgia or that you can go beat Bama or Ohio State? It's to me, it's the veteran skill players with breakouts from the line. The reality, however, is neither scenario of those gives you a chance to win a title. If Notre Dame wants to have a championship caliber offense, you need the youth movement at the skill positions and the line to be a success. That's going to be the big key. And we're talking sophomore class, freshman class, and then a couple of those redshirt sophomores that didn't play a whole lot. And that's what gets me excited about about what the offense can be. But at the same time, if we're being honest, that's a lot of ifs. And if you want to know what the potential downfall can be for this football team next year, it's that right there. It's that there's, there's so many ifs, and you're relying so much on development of young players to really be able to take yourself to that next level without them breaking out. I still think this is a 10 and two top 15 football team, but if the youth movement doesn't really take over on offense, I don't think you can be any better than 10 and two. And I think there's a better chance you go nine and three and stub your toe. than you go 11 and one or 12 and oh. And so that's why to me, you need both. And the, the exciting thing is, it's elite talent. Jeremiah Love, top 50 player coming out of high school for me. Jaden Greathouse, Jadarian Jar- 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 Price, top 100 players coming out for me. Jordan Faison's turned out to be a really good player. 
Uh, Charles Jagasaw, five-star player for me. Absher Pendleton, four-star top 200 players for me. Joe Odding, four-star top 250 player for me. Uh, you talk about Billy Shrouth, top 100 player for me. I had Ashton Craig as a top 250 player. You could you could throw Emil Wagner in that conversation. And then there's one other guy that I'm talking that I, that you think about in this youth movement too, or two one position, is what happens at quarterback this year, this spring and fall. Or do we see Kenny Minchie and CJ Carr really seize hold of that number two quarterback job? So that's another aspect to look at too. Although it may not have the direct impact on this season, so I didn't talk a lot about it. But that's another thing to look at. But these are all talented guys. Kenny Minchie has a top 100 player. C.J. Carr as a, as a five-star player. Gary Lambert as a five-star player. Y'all that have been following me for a while know I don't hand out a lot of five-stars. And you had three in the freshman class on offense this year with Cam Williams, C.J. Carr, and Gerby Lambert. And then you talk about all the top 50 and 100 top caliber players. Jeremiah Love, Great House, um, Jadarian Price, Billy Shrouf. And then guys that have turned out to be good players that we didn't think think that was the case. And when you look at Jordan Faison and what he's turned out to be. So lots to be excited about. But we also have to be honest and say but there's a lot of question marks because you don't often see teams go have the championship level success with that much youth on offense. The last time that I can really remember that being the case was 2018 with Clemson. You had a true freshman quarterback, true sophomore running back that was your leading rusher. Your leading receiver was a true sophomore. Your second best receiver was a true freshman. That was a very young team. Can Notre Dame repeat that? Now, the positive for Notre Dame is they're going to have a much more experienced quarterback. but And they have some veteran skill players that can complement those younger players as well. But you're going to really need that young lineman to step up. And the youth movement has got to hit on the perimeter and inside. That's going to be a key to the Notre Dame offense being as good as it as it can be, and good enough for Notre Dame to compete for a championship. Now let's move over to the defense because this is a little bit of a different situation for me. The defense is going to be pretty good again this year. We'll we'll dive more into this as we get closer to the season. I, I think the defense could be good, pretty good, not elite early in the year. I'll, and we'll dive into more reasons why as we get closer to the season, just because of some moving parts and some different things. But I think overall, this is still going to be a really good defense on the whole because once it kind of clicks for them, whether it's game three, game four, game five, I think this defense is going to take off and finish on a really high note which is kind of how it went in 2023. It's just, but it's it's still – and when I talk about the struggles early, I'm it's still going to be a really good defense, like a top 15 defense. It's just not going to be the shutdown, dominant, just you know you can't score on this football team type of group that they were at times last year. Maybe, maybe they will. I'm just I'm, – I'm, I'm preparing myself for the fact that they're going to need a little bit of time to really get to that, you know, maybe a month or so. But – the reason that I'm I'm not confident in a step back next year is because of the experience that this defense has. You have two All-American caliber players in the secondary. You've got a six-year senior coming back at linebacker, which I mentioned earlier in Jack Kaiser. You've got a fifth and a six-year senior starting at defensive line, at defensive tackle. You've got a fifth-year senior starting at the, at the Viper position. If all else fails and nobody steps up as in the young groups, you're going to have a six-year senior starting at, at big end. If he gets beat out, it's because he gets beat out by a junior that played a lot of football last year. So in a lot of play, you've got to transfer in Jordan Clark, who's a six-year senior. You've got to transfer in Rod Hurd, who's a fifth-year senior. The experience and proven production on defense is significantly greater than it is on offense. And so that's why – I would argue that the offense has a higher ceiling for 2024, but the defense has a much higher floor. And, the, and, and I'm much more certain that they're going to be a good group. And, and I'm pretty confident that they're going to be a pretty good defense next year. Having said that, if this is going to be a truly elite defense, a carrier football team on a four-game run for a title type of defense, they're going to need a youth, their own version of a youth movement. Now, I would argue that outside of one linebacker spot, 
you probably need one sophomore or freshman to emerge at one of the three linebacker spots. But outside of that, there's not a need for any other young players to start. You're if if Christian Gray doesn't break out, you've got Jade Mickey at corner. If Adon Schuler or Luke Talents don't break out, you've got Rod Hurd and and Xavier Watts coming back at safety. And you can kind of do this everywhere. But here's what I'll say. If the defense is going to be elite, it's going to be because the veterans keep doing what they're doing, but it's because the freshman and sophomore classes make an impact at on all three levels. Somebody steps up on all three levels. And as I talked about yesterday, my breakouts, and, and, and with some of these guys, I'm not going to talk as much about them because I don't just repeat what we talked about yesterday. So these first three guys that I'm going to discuss, I'm going to just mentally discuss, mention you know, why it's important that the youth movement happened because they were guys that I mentioned a lot yesterday in the breakout section. And that's Christian Gray, Drake Bowen, and Jaden Osbury. Now, with Christian Gray, we, we as we discussed yesterday, if Christian Gray has a breakout, then you have a chance to have one of the two or three best corner rooms in the entire country, if not the best. I don't want to say it's the best because there's some there's some good corner rooms out there. I think Ohio State has a pretty darn good cornerback room uh, coming back next year with Denzel Burke, and, and Davidson's going to be a year older. You've got Jordan Hancock comes back. You've got some freshmen coming in. And Ohio State has a chance to have a very, very good cornerback room as well. There's some other groups that have a chance to have some really good cornerback rooms coming back next year. But if Christian Gray breaks out and is the player we all think he can be, then you've got Benjamin Morrison, who's arguably – you know, one of the three or four best corners in the country with one of the best young players in the country who could maybe match what Benjamin Morrison did last year. Then you've got Jaden Mickey for depth. You've got Clarence Lewis for depth. You've got, you know, Leonard Moore for depth. You've got Chance Tucker for depth. You've got Carson Hobbs for depth. So now you've got impact starters and you've got really good depth behind it, including very experienced depth with depth with Clarence Lewis and, and Jaden Mickey. So, it's not that you can't still have a very good secondary next year without Christian Gray. If Christian Gray is just a, you know, just a normal freshman to sophomore build on what he was last year, just normal progression, you're going to have an outstanding top five to eight cornerback room anyway, in my opinion, with him and Mickey at one spot, Jordan Clark and Micah Bell in the other slot. Micah Bell's another one that's part of this youth movement, and then Benjamin Morrison in the boundary. But if Christian Gray breaks out, then you have a chance to be really special. Now, here's the even less likely but just as impactful aspect of it. What if Micah Bell has a light go on this offseason and he figures it out technically and schematically and he takes to playing defense? You're talking about a kid who's the fastest football player on your team. You're talking about a kid who had one of the five best 200-meter dash times in the nation amongst track athletes when he was a junior with 20.89. You're talking about a kid who's ran, I think, five or six low 10 fours and the 100 meter dash you're talking about a kid that in one day in high school in texas won the 100 meter dash champion state championship the 200 dash, uh, dash state championship the long jump and the triple jump state championships all in the same day what if the light goes on for him and christian gray so there's a lot of excitement there the difference between that position and offense is you don't need those two things to happen if those two things happen or one of those two things happen happens, it raises the bar even higher. It, the bar's already pretty high, but what this does, I shouldn't say the floor is really high. What this does is it raises the ceiling of what the defense can be in 2023. Then you get to linebacker, and it's that's really where the question is. is you could be a 4-2-5 team with Jack Kaiser and Jalen Sneed in the middle and be okay at that position, you know, because Jack can do some good things. The problem is you're going to get into some of those bigger, better teams you play. And you've got a kid that right now is listed at 218 and a guy that's listed at 232 and Jack Kaiser that we all know is not really a 232 pound guy and doesn't play like a 232 pound guy. He's a smaller guy. You're going to have some trouble with some of those better running teams. There's two guys to me that one of them has to break three guys to me. One of them has to break out. If two of the three break out, you're going to be really good inside. The first two we talked about yesterday, I'm not going to dive into them a whole lot. They're true sophomores, Drake Bowen and Jaden Osbury. If one of those two guys forces his way into the lineup, now Jaden Osbury is only listed at between 220, 225. I've heard he's a little bigger than the 220 he's listed at. I've heard he's closer to 225, 228. 
but he plays powerful. He's powerful at that size. Drake Bowen's 235. He'll be 240 by the fall. Powerful, can run. Those two guys are true inside backers. Now, right now, Jaden Osbury's playing Rover. And, and I think he can play Rover at a high level, but I really think he has the most chance to have an impact inside. I talked a lot about those guys yesterday. They're spring breakout players for me. But I'm a big fan of having a wider margin for error. And it, you, there's a chance that two guys don't step up or at least don't step up to the degree that we hope they step up. But there's a third guy in this conversation. And I'm not even talking about Preston Zinner, who could be a breakout guy. I'm talking about Kingston Viliyama Asa. Between Drake Bowen, Jaden Osbury, and Kingston, you've got a chance to have at least one young linebacker not only step into the lineup, because one of them is going to have to start. But it's like we talk about the offensive line. Just because you're starting doesn't mean you really earned it. And what I mean by that is not that you're getting special favors, but it's kind of like none of y'all played well or played championship caliber football, but of the guys who didn't play championship football, you did the best of all of them. That's not really earning it. That's a more of a def by default type of starting job. One of those three guys, or hopefully two, I'm just going to be honest, hopefully two, uh, in my opinion of those three guys, steps up and says, nope, this is mine. I've got this because if if one of them steps up, it raises the bar even higher, the ceiling even higher. If two of those three step up, then the ceiling is now through the roof because this is a very linebacker-dependent defensive scheme, very, very much so. The way that Al Gold likes to call a game, if you don't have linebackers that know what they're doing and have playmaking ability – and playmaking production, you can be a solid defense, a good top 25 caliber defense. You're not going to be a defense that's competing for championships. In order to be a defense competing for championships, you have to get at least one of those three players, because I would argue that's your three most naturally gifted football players. Jaden Jalen Sneed could be put in this conversation. I don't, because he's a third-year player that started two games as a freshman, even though he redshirted. You know, he could be that kind of guy. As well, he's a very talented athlete, but Jalen hasn't showed the same natural football talent yet. Now, if Jaden Jalen has a breakout and one of these two guys has a breakout, then the linebacking core is going to be outstanding. But there's a lot of scenarios there, but you're going to need at least one of those three guys to really step up and say, hey, this is mine. If two of them step up, then you're going to be really explosive and dynamic at the linebacker position. And so you, you're, you're needed. So you, we just talked about the two most important, two, two very, very important positions in the defense that alter how you can, how you can call a game based on how they play. When you talk about the corners and you talk about linebackers, but they're not alone. The safety position is also here, but the safety position is a little bit different. Now for the spring, the safety position is very important and you need some guys to step in and perform well during the spring. And but they don't need to start. If if a Don Schuler and Luke Talich or Ben Minnick or Kenny Kennedy Erlacher, who are the four young players at safety, if they're just good solid players, then guess what? They're going to be rotation guys, and they're and you're going to be fine because that's really all you had coming off the bench last year. And then Rod Hurd steps into the starting lineup. But if one of those guys can really have a breakout season, and and either even if he doesn't start but force his way and say, hey, look, you got to play me because I, I can make plays. They need that from a rotation standpoint. But if a guy really takes a big step and forces himself and, and, and starts, then, then you're even better. But you don't need that. that that's where this position is a little bit different. Now, the good news is there's some good players there. I'm, a, I'm very high on the Don Schuler. You guys know that. You know, he's a kid that's a, a just a downhill missile. He runs better than I thought he was going to run. When, I mean, I graded him as a four-star player coming out. But when I watched him move around last year in pregame in some of the games he he was he got in and, and a couple of the practices we saw, I was surprised how well Adon moved. And we saw it again in the first practice of, of the spring. He runs better than I thought he was going to run. He was a quality athlete, but he's a little bit more explosive than I thought he was going to be. But he's a thumper, and he's a kid that makes a lot of plays in a run game. I think Adon's a guy that I kind of have my eye on as like – if I had to bet now, he'd be the safety that I'd bet on taking that step. 
Now, there's another player to me that is really key to this. I It may not be fair to Adon that I just expect him to go out this spring and perform well, but I do. And he's important to this this whole discussion, this whole youth movement discussion. Adon's got to be that guy. If he doesn't step up, it throws things off. But I kind of expect him to. But there needs to be one more guy. Is that going to be Ben Minnick? We'll see. But the guy that I'm really curious to see perform this spring is Luke Talich. Because, you know, Ben Minnick could be that guy, but I, I just can, I'm concerned about his ability to stay healthy over the course of an entire season. You know, Bronte Johnson already has a shoulder injury. Maybe he comes in as a freshman and makes an impact. He could potentially do that. He's a very talented top 100 guy. But, you know, I, I need to see Bronte with pads on first before I really get too excited about his ability to help right now. I think he's got star potential down the road, but he might need a year to kind of get used to playing defense. He was just kind of an athlete that did his thing at in high school. So there might be a, a little steeper learning curve for him. He's a top 100 talent, but he's got he's got that ability. I really have my eye on Luke Talich this year. And as you guys know, Luke Talich is a walk-on, former walk-on. He's now a former walk-on, I should say, because he's now on scholarship, as Marcus Freeman um, made clear. But uh, we, we've talked about this. We knew that he was eventually going to be on scholarship. That's not that's not a surprise to anybody. That was always part of the plan. And so you're talking about a kid that's listed at 6'4", 210 pounds. That's a former walk-on. But as we've as we've talked about in the past, this is a kid that had scholarship offers from Washington State, Oregon State, and Utah. Utah and Oregon State have two pretty darn good defenses the last few years. Th those three schools, and also Colorado State, who's another uh, in Wyoming, who are also FBS schools, he had five FBS offers, including three Pac-12 offers last year. This is a power five football player. Now, is he a solid safety who's going to be a great special teams player? Maybe. Is he just a rotation guy that's a great special teams player? That that's that could just be all he is. Uh, and, and when you look at Luke Talich, because it's such a jump from where he was to where he is now. I mean, the kid, but the kid's already earned a starting job on special teams. He had, I think, over 160, something like that. Or, or next, he had over 100, about 100, a um, little under 100, actually, special team staff snaps last year because he was a starter on the kick coverage team. And he had, so he spent some time a little bit on punt coverage as well. But he was a starter on the kick coverage team as a freshman. Missed the last three games of the year with an injury. He's back now, though. He's a kid that I have my eye on. He's six four. He's two ten. He can run. I was really impressed with his closing speed at the practice we saw. We know he's got vertical speed. He can kind of play center field. He can come downhill. Can he handle the coverage ability? Is he strong enough at the point of attack to be a great tackler or a strong tackler? Those are all questions we all know. What are his instincts and in coverage? I don't know the answer to that. There's a lot of things I have to learn about Luke, but here's what I know. He was an elite high school football player at his level, dominated his level. He's a long, rangy, athletic kid with talent. I need to see how he performs against players that are of equal ability or superior ability before I get too excited about what Luke can do. But it's hard sometimes not to because when you watch the kid run at 6'4", 210, it's hard not to be like, dude, I hope that kid can figure it out because you can't teach 6'4", 210 with that kind of downhill speed. So Luke Talich is another guy that you look at and say, this is another long, rangy, athletic kid that's got a chance to be something, right? And we've seen already Jordan Faison break out. Can Luke Talich be the former walk-on that breaks out for Notre Dame this year on defense? We'll find out. But he's going to have to stay healthy. That's going to be a big thing. Him and him and um, Ben Minnick both are guys that I can, I'm concerned about their ability to stay healthy because they haven't so far at Notre Dame. But definitely keep your eye on Luke Talich. If if Adon and Luke both have really good springs, then I'm, my opinion of the safety position completely changes going into the fall because you already have an All-American. I think at the very least, Rod Hurd's going to be solid, right? I mean, you know, just solid player. And then if you get these two kids to step up, you've got a really good four-man rotation that I would argue – it's probably going to be better than the three man rotation you had last year, if we're if we're being honest. So, but but you need those two young guys to step up. Maybe Bronte steps up in the fall, but those two are there for now. And then you also you're in a situation too where there's another young player that I think could potentially have as big of an impact as any of the guys we've talked about on defense. Maybe not as a full time player, but as a situational player, and that's. 
Bubakar Traore. I have no idea what to expect from him. And his sack against USC last year was a really impressive thing, but there's a reason he didn't play a whole lot other than that. You saw it in the bowl game. Really twitchy, athletic, long, for days long. But he's still learning how to play football. And you don't know when that light's going to go on for him. He could end up being a lightly used rotation player next year. He could end up being a, 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 a pass game specialist that is really impactful in rushing downs, or he can end up becoming a key part of the rotation, if not a starter. I mean, he's got the ability to be that. He's got the ability to go from a freshman who didn't play much to a sophomore that racks up eight to nine sacks. He has that kind of athletic talent, length, strength, twitchiness, but he's still super raw. And that's why he's a bit of a wild card. And the thing is, they don't need him to really step up this year. But if he does, it's a it's a boost. Because, I mean, look, the top three Vipers from last year are still all on the team. They didn't lose any of those guys. And you were a pretty darn good defense with their production. If they just improve a little bit, you're solid at the Viper position. You're not great, but you're really good everywhere else. So those are guys, to me, when I talk about a youth movement. And you could throw in guys like Josh Burnham and Donovan Heinish and Jalen Seed, as I mentioned before, but those guys are redshirt redshirt sophomores that that have played football. I mean, have, have been on the team for now going into their third year. They're a little bit different. The youth here on defense is going to be the key. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot of talent. How many of these guys step up? We're going to find that out. And how those guys step up is going to tell us if this is a really good defense or can this be an elite defense? And that's what we're going to find out. We're going to find that out here this spring. So, and we'll start to find some of that out this spring. We'll find out even more in the fall. So, but when you put them two to, the two together, you guys see Notre Dame can't be the team that we're hoping that they're going to be this year without a youth movement. There's a lot of options. There's a lot of really talented young players. And if you want to know why Notre Dame's probably not going to have big portal classes the next couple of years, it's because of this, because there's so many talented young players. And and so, but we, what we don't know is how many of them are ready for prime time. How many of them are ready to be starters? How many of them are ready to be to be standouts? How many of them are going to be able to step in when the when the lights are the brightest and perform at a high level? I, I don't know that we we don't know the answer to that. And any of none of them have have proven to be that kind of playmaker in that kind of moment. I'd say the closest we've seen to that is probably Great House. Because he he per, stepped up and performed really well early against Ohio State, you could tell the moment was not too big for him. You know, Faison to a degree has done that. You know, the road game against Louisville, he stepped up. That was a, a big moment. The, the bowl game against Oregon State, that's a little different than Ohio State. You know, Florida State, Georgia, Bama, but you feel a little bit about that there. Defensively, all those guys are unknowns. I mean, you say, hey man, Christian Gray stepped up and was huge against Pitt. Pitt stunk. I mean, it was a great. It was great for Christian, and we learned a lot about him. But does that mean he's ready to go out there and, you know, do to the next Marvin Harrison what Benjamin Morrison and and Cam Hart did to the, to Benjamin Mo- to to Marvin Harrison this year? Did to Josh Downs the year before? You know, did to you know all the top receivers they've they've played the last couple of years? I don't know the answer to that. And and so we're we have a lot to learn about this group. I'm excited about the talent. I'm excited about the potential. I think there's a chance for them to be really impactful, but now they got to go out and prove it. And and that's why I say the youth movement happening in Notre Dame is very, very important. If it doesn't happen, this team can be good next year. 10 and 2 is a good season. It's not a great season. With if they're going to be a great team, they need the veterans to do what we we expect them to do, but they're going to need a youth movement on both sides of the ball. And that's going to be very, very key for this team. I'm going to talk about some veterans next, but before we get into the veteran conversation and before we start talking about the college football playoff and what's the latest there, I want you guys to do me a favor, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share this podcast, give us a five-star review. We'd greatly appreciate that. And of course, if you have not done so, sign up for the message boards at boards.irishbreakdown.com. Great monthly fee, have annual memberships, you have booster clubs. If you just want to support Irish Breakdown, all that good stuff. And if you join a booster club, you get some free merch. You get a free IB club mug that only goes to the club members. If you're in the blue or the shamrock club, and if you join the gold club, you not only get a IB club mug, you also get an, a free IB gold club t-shirt. You can have that as well. So you check that out. That's only for members who sign up at boards at hoursbreakdown.com.
I need to create like an intermission type of thing between shows when I'm doing solo shows so I can take deep breaths and take drinks without you guys having to see it all. But uh, we power through nonetheless. Today's part two of today's show is going to look at the veterans that have to step up for Notre Dame. And every year you get into these positions where some some veteran player that you that you thought could be good, but he's never really panned out. He's never really produced a lot. He's never really, you know, been that kind of guy. Steps into the the spotlight, and you're like, wow, like where'd that guy come from? And man, where would this team be if that guy didn't step up? In recent years, we've seen that happen a lot at receiver, for example. You know, Miles Boykin didn't really do a lot until his senior year. I mean, his, his claim to fame was stepping up in the bowl game as at the end of his junior year against LSU, which was huge. Played great that game, but it wasn't until the end of his junior year that that happened. And that only happened because of an injury to other players. Equinemi St. Or excuse me. Um, yeah, Equinemi St. Brown was hurt. Chase Claypool was hurt. Uh, Equinemi started the game, got hurt at halftime. Chase was hurt before the game. And so – he, had, he was forced to line up, and he stepped up and played, and then comes out in 2018, and he balls out. You know, Javon McKinley doesn't do a whole lot. His first four years steps up in his last year at Notre Dame in 2020, balls out. He's their best receiver that season on a team that went, you know, 10-0 in the regular season, played in the ACC title game, made the college football playoff. You know, so we've seen these situations where veteran players kind of step up and they get their last chance, and, hey, if you don't step up now, man, you know, who, wh when's that going to be? We saw some veterans kind of go from, you know, some breakout players like Howard Cross was a good rotation player for four years and then fifth year steps up. They needed him to be big. He stepped up and he was big. We saw Javante Jean, Jean Baptiste kind of got his last chance to be that guy this past year and, and he stepped up. So we've seen this happen to a lot of players. And then there's other times where, hey, this is your chance to shine and it doesn't happen. And there are several, several veterans on this football team this year that for different reasons, and in different situations, are kind of stepping into a bit of a now or never moment. For some guys, it's because they're out of eligibility after this. For a lot of other guys, though, it's you may have eligibility left, but if you don't step up this year, it's what's the point of us bringing you back for a fifth or a sixth year? And then for some other players who have done some decent things, if you don't take a jump this year, it ties back to part one of the show you're going to find yourself getting beat out by a younger player. And if you get beat out by a younger player, the odds of a veteran losing his starting job to a young guy and then winning it back later are significantly less than a veteran getting a job because a younger guy was that. And then him, you know, eventually, hey, I'm good enough and I can get that job. So there's several players I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about them uh, offense and defense together. But there's there's really – the offensive line is the first place that I that I get to in this conversation. And, and think back to what we talked about in the first part of the show. All these talented young players, to, to Charles Jagasaw, and, and somebody just pointed out like Tobias Merriweather. Tobias Merriweather is a so, true sophomore last year. So he, he is a different type of player than what we're talking about. Uh, Tobias Merriweather, through two years of college, has more catches than Miles Boykin and Javon McKinley had through two years combined. So I think it's a little too early to write him off. I'm more focusing on veterans, older players. And when you look at the offensive line conversation from earlier and you and you focus on um, the Charles Jagasaw and we talked about Billy Shrouth and Ashton Craig – potentially Mill Wagner, Sullivan Absher, Sam Pendleton, Joe Odding. You've got Gilby Lambert coming in. Peter Jones is a guy that I think could maybe help out and, and, and play as a younger player. It puts a lot of pressure on guys like Tosh Baker, Pat Coogan, and Rocco Spindler. And they're going into their senior seasons for Pat and Rocco, and then Tosh is going into his fifth season. Now, for Tosh, he obviously – has less experience than Pat Coogan. So I'll talk about him first, but I think he is also a guy that that is a little bit of the biggest unknown of this conversation. You know, Tosh came into Notre Dame with a hot, great reputation, top 100 player. As a redshirt freshman, uh, got two starts under his belt with because of certain players being out. You had, obviously, Blake Fisher got hurt in the first game. Then Michael Carmody steps into the starting lineup. He gets hurt. And then Tosh steps in, plays two games. He gets hurt. Well, he's been a backup ever since. 
Last year, he gets a start against Ohio State in a, a six offensive line set. And then a second start of the season comes in the win over Oregon State. I thought Tosh was solid in that game. You know, I, I thought he did some good things. He wasn't dominant. He wasn't great, but he did his job. He was more steady in, in that one game than really what we saw from the right tackle position for much of the year. We didn't see the the impact. Like So like when Blake Fisher, for example, when Blake was good, Blake was really good. The problem is when Blake wasn't good, he was pretty bad, and and so that that's obviously a concern that that you have when you look at when you look at that situation. But when you look at Tosh Baker, for example, you know I thought Tosh came in in the bowl game and was solid. You know nothing special, just just solid, and you know handled himself in pass protection, handled himself in the run game, just handled himself. It, but if you're Notre Dame, you need him to be better than just okay, handle yourself. Well, he's in a situation now where if Tosh doesn't take a jump as a player, there's just too many talented young players that are there to push him. There, you know, you've got Emil Wagner, you've got Sullivan Absher, you've got Gerby Lambert coming in. If if the light doesn't go on for Tosh, then it's not going to go on. And plus, Tosh is in his last season of eligibility. After like after last season, I was under the impression that Tosh had an extra year, but I've got it confirmed that he does not. He's done after this year. So this is his last chance to make a to make a statement. The reason that matters is because if if you're a fifth year senior and you're not really better or that much better than a bunch of young guys, there's a chance that this staff may lean into this and say, hey, look, we're young everywhere else. Let's just go with the most talented players we have and just deal with it. Because why would I have a fifth year senior who's not really the talent that we thought he would be? Who's inconsistent when I can put in Sullivan Absher or, you know, or I don't say Emil Wagner because I don't know that Emil Wagner can handle the job, but let's say Sullivan Absher's, you know, hey, he's going to be inconsistent. He's going to lose some reps, but he's dominant at times too. If, if my fifth year senior is going to be inconsistent and lose reps, why not put the six foot seven, 330 pound redshirt freshman who mauls people in the game? You, you know what I mean? So for Tosh, this spring is big for him. Because he has to prove he can be a steady player. If Tosh just does like, there's a very underrated quality that some that people have lost about offensive linemen in this era of Twitter highlights, and that is, do you just do your job every play? If Notre Dame's five offensive linemen simply just do their job every single play, they're going to have an elite offense. Clemson was great about this in sixteen and eighteen. Like their their best offensive lineman on their sixth or their 18 title team, I thought was their left tackle, and he went undrafted. Their highest drafted guy from that offensive line was a guard who went in the fourth round. Like it was not in a there was not a lot of elite talent there, but they just kind of did their job every snap. Just did, they played hard and they did their job. If Tosh just plays hard and does his snap every you know, does his job every snap, he'll start and he'll be a set steady player for Notre Dame. The issue that Tosh has had in his career, and this is his last chance to prove that he can be better than that, is he will have, you know, in 10 snaps, he'll have seven just steady, do your job snaps. The problem is the three that aren't steady, do your job snaps, he gets whipped. And, you know, sometimes it's for different reasons. Sometimes he doesn't move his feet and he gets knocked back. Sometimes he comes out of a stance too high. And so he's not able to get outside as quick enough or guys get in his chest and drive him back. I've seen that as well. And for Tosh this spring and into fall, he's got to get rid of that. And we saw that again in the, in the first spring practice where there just were two snaps where Jordan Patel just blows right by him. Those are the things Tosh is going to have to eliminate because this is his last chance to really become that everyday starter impact player. Right now, he's still that guy. He's still the number one guy. But – if he doesn't step up, then you're going to see some younger players really push him. And I would say the same thing for Pat Coogan and Rocco Spindler. Now, obviously, those two guys have shown more than Tosh has up to this point, and, and there's true seniors, so there's more eligibility left. But they're in situations where there's some really talented younger players pushing them. Already the expectation is, is that Rocco Spindler has already lost the starting job to Billy Shrouth. Is that true? Well, if Rocco doesn't play better than he did last year, that will be true. Now, the interesting thing with Rocco is, I, I, I've said this before, Ryan and I have talked about this, his highs were better than Pat Coogan's highs. 
when Rocco was coming off and driving his feet and, and, work, and you know, moving and not stopping his feet and not doing those type of things, he could really move people in the run game. I mean, really could move people in the run game. The problem he had is that, that when he was not on his game, he had some really bad reps. And he's going to have to eliminate that. He's going to have to become a more consistent player. He's going to have to be in even better shape than he was last year. And he's working towards that, been working towards that. But he's a guy that is just, you know, he can he has a tendency to at times to get some bad weight on him. But the bigger thing is he just stops moving his feet too often. And that's something he's going to have to correct and it's something he's going to have to get better at. And if he doesn't get better at that, then he's he's just not going to be able to beat out Billy Shroud or Pat Coogan. If if Bill if Pat Coogan's another guy, I had somebody yesterday trying to argue with me that that Pat Coogan was a mauler all last year, and I just maybe he was. I just didn't see it. You know, I see a guy that does his job and is a steady kid, tough kid, but he doesn't move people, and he's not a very athletic kid. And you just you you kind of need a better talent there. But at the same time, Pat for the most part was pretty good about just he did his job. As far as an assignment standpoint, the problem is he's not he's not athletic enough to really play at a high level, and I don't know that that can change. He, this spring's going to be big for him because if there is a true competition, he's going to have some issues. And I, and I pointed this out yesterday, or no, it was was it no, it wasn't yesterday. It was in an article I did in my guard, my center guard preview. But if you look at the offense last year and you look at the pass blocking, and and somebody had asked, you know, comparing kind of he stand and Joe Rudolph and and Harry he stands last year. Notre Dame had 390 dropbacks. In Joe Rudolph's first year, they had 390 dropbacks. They gave up, I believe, it was 83 pressures last year and only 60 the year before. They gave up 32 hits plus sacks in the quarterback last year just from the linemen compared to 19 the year before with basically the same guys. Where they were different was up the middle at scent, at guard. Pat Coogan last year had 25 total, gave up 25 pressures. That And Rocco gave up 15. That's 40 pressures from your two starting guards. 40. You look at where you were in the 2022 season. And this is pro football focus numbers. The combination of Josh Lugg and Jarrett Patterson alone only had 21 total pressures and only three total hits plus sacks in a quarterback. If you take the entire starting three of Zeke Carell, Josh Lugg, and, jo and Jarrett Patterson, they only gave up 34 pressures all year and they only gave up eight total hits plus sacks in the quarterback. If you look at the 2023 offensive line and you take the, the interior, you just take the guards, forget the tackle, just look at the guards. So that's Billy Shrouth, Rocco Spindler, Pat Coogan, the three guys that started. Last year, they had a total of 46 pressures allowed, and they had a total of, let's see, 7, 8, 15, 18, 18 total hits plus sacks in the quarterback. So again, Year before, your guard starters and your and your center had 34 total pressures allowed and only eight hits plus sacks in the quarterback. Your guards alone last year gave up 46 total pressures and 18 hits plus sacks in the quarterback. Those two guys primarily were Rocco and 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 Pat Coogan. Now Zeke Carell last season um, actually was improved from his previous season from a pass protection standpoint. Zeke had 13 pressures allowed uh, in 13 games. Well, I shouldn't say improved. I should say he gave up fewer, but obviously Zeke played fewer fewer games. But his overall success rate in pass pro was still pretty good last year. He His issues were more run game related. But pass pro, he was fine. But he still gave up 10 pressures and two sacks plus hits on the quarterback. So if you put your entire interior in there and you also include the center, I'm going to give you these numbers here real quick. You had 10 more pressures for Zeke Carell, and you had uh, uh, two hits plus sacks in the quarterback. Ashton Craig had three pressures allowed. He had one hit plus – or excuse me, let me see here. Where was he? One hit plus uh, – sack plus hit on the quarterback. So you had a total of 59 pressures allowed and 21 sacks plus hits on the quarterback from your starting lineup and up the middle compared to 34 and 8 last year. That's got to get a ton better a ton better. And the, the primary culprits were Rocco and Pat Coogan, especially Pat Coogan. And so you, 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 I mean, it's, it's easy to look at and see as, as, as rough a time as Rocco had last year, Rocco still had a higher win rate 
in pass pro than Pat Coogan. It wasn't great, but it was still better. And so they're going to have to get a lot better up the middle. And if they don't, last year you had a bunch of redshirt freshmen and freshmen that were battling them. This year, all those redshirt freshmen are now redshirt sophomores. You've got you know, Ty Chan, Billy Shrouf, Ashton Craig are all stepping into this situation. You've got now your freshmen are now second year guys, Sam Pendleton, Sullivan Absher, Joe Odding, Christopher Tarek. There's a lot more experience. Plus you're welcoming Peter Jones and Gerby Lambert into the equation. So to me, if, if there's no excuse to still roll with those veterans, if they play anything like they did last year, none, because here's my point. If they're going to be that unproductive, then just go with your more talented, younger players. Just roll with it. Because at least you'll get more dominant snaps. Like with Pat Coogan, if he's anything like it was last year, you're not getting dominant snaps from him. So if he's going to give up that many pressures, then just put in Sullivan Absher or Sam Pendleton or somebody like that who is going to give up the same number of pressures and have mistakes, but they're going to have more dominant moments. Now, will Joe Rudolph do that? I don't know. We'll find out. The other option is that these two young guys, these two veterans, play better. I mean, I just gave you all the production and numbers, but here's the difference between this group and last year's group. When you look at the guards, Jarrett Patterson and Josh Lug, they had a bunch of starts coming into last year. Jarrett Patterson was a four-year starter. Josh Lug had started, you know, several games in 2020. He had started the entire 2021 season at right tackle. He had, I think, five, three or four starts at right tackle in 2019. So Josh and Jarrett had a ton of snaps under their belts coming into last year. You would hope that they would be better in pass pro and from an assignment standpoint than three guys that were than two guys that were making their first starts of their career. Pat Coogan and Rocco barely played their first two years at Notre Dame. Barely played. A couple mop-up snaps here and there. Barely played. So you'd expect it to be better. Now the question is how much, or I mean, you'd expect them to struggle. Now the question is how much better can they get? And that's going to be the key. How much does the experience help them? How much does being in year two of working with Coach Rudolph help them? Now, how helps them? They learn him. He now knows them better. He now now knows what better what buttons to push, what their weaknesses are, what their strengths are, all those type of things. He can then help them improve. So that's an important part of this conversation. You expect them to be better, but how much better? They need to be a lot better, in my opinion. And forget holding off other guys even if Joe Rudolph decides hey I'm rolling with the veterans for whatever reason and that's the decision he and Mike Demrock make then they're going to need those guys to step up in that situation too so either way they have to step up and play they have to step up and play so whether the guard plays got to get a lot better a lot better than it was last year and it can be one of three ways one is the two veterans step up and get a lot better the other way is Younger players beat the veterans out, which means they're better. And then, of course, the third is a combination of both. One of Coogan or Rocco wins the starting guard job. And then one of the younger players, we think most likely Billy Shrouth, wins the other guard position. So when you talk about veterans that are kind of entering into a last chance opportunity, that group, to me, takes it on offense. There's, you know, Steve Angeli you could talk about here. If he doesn't have a really big spring and hold off the two younger players, He's in a similar situation where if he gets passed up between now and the start of the season by Kenny Minchie, CJ Carr, he's not going to get that job back. That that just that just doesn't happen. He's another guy. And then there's there's two receivers, Jaden Thomas to a degree. It's kind of like, can this be the year that Jaden stays healthy? But there's another veteran receiver to me that I want to talk about even more. And that's Deion Colsey. This, he might be the biggest enigma on the entire offensive football team. Because when you look at Dion, you see all the tools. I mean, goodness gracious, 6'5", 215, bass. I mean, we we were at a fall camp practice last year, and I'm watching Benjamin Morrison against Dion Colsey in a one-on-one, and it's just a straight post route. I mean, it wasn't anything sexy where Benjamin tri- you know, where, where Benjamin got spun around by a great release. It wasn't a mistake by Benjamin where he, you know, tripped and fell and 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 it allowed Dion to go deep and all those type of things. It was Dion beat him off off the line, stemmed him up, and just hit the stuck stuck the post and just outran Benjamin by five yards on a post route. And you're like, holy moly. 
Here's the problem. He dropped the pass in the end zone. Should have been an easy touchdown. He dropped the pass. And that's kind of been the thing with, with Dion is he'll flash things and he'll show you things where you're like, boy, man, oh, man, this guy is really, really good. But then you'll see things where you're like, what the heck was that? You know, we watched him against Syracuse. I mean, he should have had 10 catches against Syracuse. We watched it in 2022. He should have, he, he was very good against USC. Had a big touchdown catch. Had another big play late where he had gotten open in, in a two-hole situation. And if if Drew Pine throws that ball, Notre Dame, I think, was down set 10 at the time and and or 11. And if he makes that play, they got a chance to maybe go down a score with five, six minutes left. You're in this game again. Dion had gotten open, settled in, could have been a big play, makes one guy miss, and he can go. And then Drew just wasn't willing to make the throw, scrambles around, throws an interception. Game over. There's times when you look at Deion Coles and you're like, holy moly, this kid has got as much talent as anybody on the roster. And he just hasn't been able to put it together. And then when he starts to kind of figure it out, he gets hurt. Now, I think Deion was one of the guys that suffered last year from the poor manner in which Chancey Stuckey led that room or I should say failed to lead that room. And I think that's, I don't want to get into too much of the drama stuff, but, but I think that that's a big reason why we didn't see Dion do a whole lot last year. Does he step up this season? We'll find out. I mean, he looked pretty good in the first practice that we saw. I mean, Dion had some really good catches, looked really smooth, looked athletic. He looked the part. It's just, you know, like, like Ryan talked about the other day, we were talking about, you know, who has the biggest impact the receiver if they have a breakout? He went with Cam Williams, and I went with Deion Colsey because senior year version of Deion Colsey at his best is probably better than freshman year Cam Hart at, at Cam Williams at his best. And and Deion's that kind of guy that if if he can finally, if he can have a Miles Boykin type of of, of senior season, because again, his fir- everybody's ready to write Deion off. Oh, Deion's this and Deion's that, and 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 my whole point is. His production so far through three years is not any different than what Miles Boykin had through three years. And if you're really honest about it, it's way better than what Javon McKinley had through three years. And I'm going to pull up the numbers now and, and, and give you an example of what I'm talking about. When you look at Miles Boykin through his first four years of college, or first, excuse me, um, first three years of college, because that's what Dion has done so far. His first three years of college, Miles had – so do the math on my head real quick. 18 catches. So didn't didn't make any catches as a freshman. Caught six passes for 81 yards as a as a sophomore, and then had 12 catches for 253 yards as a junior, most of which came in the bowl game. So in three years, he had 18 catches for 334 yards and three touchdowns. Javon McKinley, through his first three years of college, actually. I think for Dion, Javon, it was his first 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, four years of college. He had 11 catches for 268 yards and four touchdowns. All of that came in 2019. Going into his senior season, Javon McKinley did not have a single catch. Keep in mind, Bo Collins or um, Dion Coles, he's going into his senior year. So think about that. Those two guys figured it out later in their careers. When you look at Dion, In three years as part of the rotation, obviously got hurt last year. He had 16 catches for 304 yards and two touchdowns. If Deion doesn't get hurt last year, he's got more catches than Miles, who had 18. He's got more yards than Miles, who had 334. And he's probably got as many, if not more, touchdowns than Miles, who had three. So while while I understand the angst about Deion Colsey, and I am with you that Deion's got to prove it. I am not expecting anything out of Deion. It's all show me you got to show me. Having said that, he is a guy that I have my eye on because he could be a game changer for Notre Dame. If Deion Colsey can have a similar late breakout that Miles Boykin and Javon McKinley had, again, almost identical numbers to Miles, way better numbers than Javon McKinley, who had zero catches going into his senior season, he changes things because you now have a boundary receiver that's 6'5", that's 215, that's fast, that's long, and that's pretty strong. And as somebody in the chat just pointed out, because I've mentioned this in the past, Dion's about a year younger than most of the kids in his grade. So he's in the, he's kind of going into the age that other guys are going into their junior seasons. 
So is this the year he finally figures it out? No idea. And if I had to bet a month's rent on it, I would not. But you can't help but think about what happens if it does. What happens if the light goes on for Dion? If it doesn't go on, he's going to get passed up by younger players. It's as simple as that. If it does go on, he could be a game changer for Notre Dame. He really could. He could He could be a guy that goes out there and has a very similar season to what Miles Boykin had as a senior. 50-plus catches, 800-plus yards, eight or nine touchdowns. He really could be that kind of guy. Uh, again, I'm not telling y'all he's going to be that. Deion's got to show it to me. He's got to show it to everybody. Deion's got to show me because he's similar to Miles because Miles, the question with Miles was never does he have talent. The question with Miles is does he want to be great? Well, Miles started to show it the spring of his senior year. He destroyed Julian Love on a regular basis. So we started to see him emerge in the spring. Does Dion have a similar emergence? I don't know. If he does, it moves, it changes the game. You can now do more with Jaden Thomas. You have that big, reliable vertical player down in the boundary. There's so much, there's so much about this football team that changes if Deion Colsey steps up. If he doesn't, he's going to get passed up. It's as simple as that. Defensively, there's a couple guys. I think Jalen Sneed, I talked about earlier, is definitely in that category. Uh, he's a guy to me that if he doesn't step up this spring, he's going to find himself getting beat out by some younger players. Drake Bowen, Jaden Allsbury, Kingston Villama Asa. He's going to have to really step up. Preston Center. Uh, Tyson Ford's another one. It, it, he might be, and I've, I've said this about a couple guys, but he might be the biggest enigma on defense because, I mean, I've talked to people around the program. They're like, dude, when Tyson wants to be great, he's great. I mean, he's really good. It's just he's got to he's got to figure it out. And and he's he's kind of like Dion that does does Tyson does Tyson want to be great? Well, every player that has talent wants to be great verbally and in their head. That's not the question. The question is, do you want to be great here in your heart, in your chest, in that 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 core of you that just strives on, hey, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to work harder than I've ever worked. I'm going to be more focused. Like there's a lot of guys in this football team, you know, and especially in that, that 2022 class that have to decide what's more important, my social life or being a great football player and being a champion. And and there's not enough of those guys that so far have made that decision. And to me, you look at a lot of these guys, and this is this this is the year that they show: can are we going to be that or not? Am I willing to say, hey, look, yeah, I enjoy going out, I enjoy this, I enjoy playing video games, I enjoy whatever, but do I sacrifice that to go out and put in the extra work to be great? Tyson Ford's the kind of kid, and I'm not saying Tyson partakes in those type of things, but I just I know that right now he's not doing the work or hasn't going into the last season, hasn't done the work to get the most out of his ability. Does that change? Does that change this spring? If it does, all of a sudden you've got a six foot five, 290 pound, long, powerful, athletic kid that could be a disruptor. Everything I said that Jason Onye could be, Tyson Ford could be that and more if the light goes on. You know, that's that's kind of the thing we're going to have to figure out with him. I don't know if that's going to be the case with Tyson, but it's now or never for him. And I think you can make a similar case to, for Junior to Alamaka, who's been, a, you know, I think Junior's going to be a lot better than he was last year. We got to remember, Junior was making the transition of Viper really last year. He had played it a little bit in pass rushing situations as a freshman, but he didn't really make the move as early as Josh Burnham did. I think Junior is going to be better this year. Does that mean he gets three or four tackles for loss and a couple sacks, or does he really provide very good backup reps or maybe even starter reps if Jordan doesn't play well or, or whatever? That's going to be an interesting part uh, about him too. And here's the here's the final one, and somebody said it in the chat. The final, it's now or never for him guy on defense is Jordan Patelho. You talk about guys that could completely change things for this football team. Imagine if all 12 games, or at least 10 of the 12 games this season, I'll let them take the, the day off against um, Northern Illinois, and I'll let them kind of take a day off against Army late in the year. But if the other 10 of the 12 games, Jordan Patejo gives us the South Carolina, Oregon State, Syracuse 2022 versions of himself, he's not only a key part of the defense, he might be your 
most disruptive and impactful defensive lineman. If we get that version of Jordan Patelho, you're talking about a guy that's going to be 10 plus tackles for loss, a guy that's going to be eight plus sacks. And, and just be a guy that you now have to set your entire protection around, which means more impact for RJ Oban and Josh Burnham on the other side. It makes it harder to defend Riley Mills and Howard Cross up the middle. It makes it a lot harder to defend some of the linebacker pressures if you have to worry about that guy being a disruptor in the boundary. And when you talk about Jordan Patelho, again, you're talking about a guy that's played a lot of snaps, a guy that's done a lot of things in his career, but he's and he's shown flashes, right? I mean, the things he did against South Carolina, guys, it wasn't a fluke. Last year against Oregon State, eh, they were, you know, started their two backup tackles. I don't put a lot into that one. But Syracuse a couple years ago, it's going against Matthew Bergeron, who was a draft pick. You know, you talk about what he did against South Carolina. That was a very good performance. Where is that guy on a consistent basis? You got to find the answer to that. And if Jordan can be that guy consistently, he changes the look of this defense dramatically so. And, but if he doesn't do it now, it's never going to happen. You know, he's got a chance to go turn himself into an NFL football player. But it's going to be about being locked in on an everyday basis and taking his craft seriously and getting the most out of his ability. He's got the tools to do it. Now he's got to figure it out and become that player or don't become that player. We'll find out which one it's going to be. So those are the veterans to me that kind of enter into a now or never situation. This spring, it starts. It's not completely now or never for the spring, but it's getting close. We got to see growth from these guys and the guys that step up this spring and start to perform well, you start to feel good about the guys that don't, they're going to find themselves getting passed up because go back to the first part of the show, first two parts of the show. There are a lot of really talented freshmen and sophomore players. If you're a veteran and you don't bring it every day, if you don't step up your game, if, if football is not more important to you than social life and all these other things that are non-academic related, there's some freshman breathing down your neck, some sophomore breathing down your neck that's hungrier than you are and every bit as talented, and you're going to get yourself passed up. If these guys answer the bell, Jalen Sneed – I mean, think about this. Defensively, imagine if the light goes on for Tyson Ford, Jalen Sneed, and Jordan Patelho. Imagine what that does for this – imagine what this Notre Dame front seven is going to look like if the light goes on for Jalen Sneed, Tyson Ford, and Jordan Patelho. Think about that. That's a huge impact, huge impact. And you start getting like really excited about what this team can be. Now we just got to find that thing and do it or not. We don't know the answer to that. It's going to be fun to watch it. We're going to get into a quick last section of the show here in a little, in a few minutes, but I want to first ask you guys to do me a favor. If you've not already done so, hit that like button, hit subscribe, subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share this podcast. If you are listening to us on our on Spotify or any other pl- podcast platforms, we would greatly appreciate a five-star review. And if you have not done so, I, I tell you a million times, I keep telling you guys, you got to sign up for the message boards. I know that's not a great advertisement to kind of guilt you into it, but I've told you a lot of times you're missing out on some great content, some great conversation on the message board and some some really like some content that is message board only content that you're just not going to miss out on. So you're definitely going to check that out as well. And you can find that at boards.irishbreakdown.com. Final part of today's show, I'm just going to briefly talk about the new college football playoff format. And I want to rehash some a conversation I've had because I think some, some folks have missed out on this. I still see a lot of angst about how Notre Dame can't get a first round playoff by. And I want to talk about that a little bit as well. So I want to I want to dive into that a little bit today. But first, we're seeing some reporting about this. You know, Heather Dinich, and there's been two people, in my opinion, that have been the most locked in and have just done absolutely great reporting. I look, I have no problem calling people out for not doing a job. You all know I have a lot of issues with with journalism, what quote unquote journalism uh in today's you know, era of football and, or excuse me, of, of journalism and, and whether it's political or sports and how so many people just care more about clickbait than they do about doing real journalism. There's two people, in my opinion, that cover college football that do it the right way. And obviously you guys know, I love Bill Bender. I'm talking about outside of Bill because what Bill does is a little bit different, but there's two national people that I think just do a great job of covering this. One is Heather Dinich. The other is, is Ross Dellinger. And they have been all over this college football playoff situation. And according to Ross Dellinger, the new format, 
past 2025 because the next two years is set in stone. It's 12-team playoff. It's set in stone. This is more about negotiations for what happens after 2025. Then the reports that Ross is, and, and you can find this at yahoo.com, but Ross says that the new contract that starts in 2026 is going to be worth $1.3 billion. Keep in mind that the current uh, way that it's formatted is the current contract is four, $460 million. And I think that needs to be reminded as some people start to lose their minds over what's kind of happening with uh, the, what's going on. So there's been a lot of conversation about what happens with the college football playoff after 2025. And to be honest with you, the SEC and the Big Ten have played this masterfully. I think they're kind of scummy for doing it. And I think they're greedy you-know-whats for doing it. And it's just more evidence of why I don't want to be a part of those two leagues. But they're looking out for their own. And they are not hiding the fact that they're being greedy about it. And they worked this masterfully. So what they did was, it comes down to, right now, the contract is the the revenue is split is evenly between the, the power five conferences, basically. And what the big 10 did and the sec did, and they got together to do this together is they said, we want guaranteed playoff slots. We want to go to 14 teams. We want four spots each. Oh my gosh, I'm losing my mind. I can't believe this. And then, okay, we'll settle for three. And I've read some reports where people have said, well, the backlash has led them to, to, to say, hey, we're not going to do that anymore. I've kind of felt for a while that that was never the end game. You'd be silly not to ask for that because if they guarantee you, if they get, if the big ACC and the Big 12 and Notre Dame and the group of five cower and give in to you, then you get what you want. Because what it comes down to is essentially the, is you get more automatic spots, which means you get more money, is essentially what it was going to be. And so they then relented. And what they have have decided to do is the revenue is going to be split up unevenly. And according to Ross Dellinger, and you can find this in his article today, that 28% of the college football playoff revenue from the playoff is going to be distributed to the Big Ten and the SEC. In the past, it was 20, 20, 20, 20, basically. And or it's like it was not quite 20, 20, because there's a little bit group given to the group of five, but it was basically five power conferences split up evenly. Now it's 48, it's 48 or 29 percent for the ACC or, or Big Ten. It's 29 percent for the SEC. It's then 16 percent for the ACC, 16 percent for the Big 12, and then 10 percent is distributed to Notre Dame and the group of five teams. And there's a lot of people flipping out about how this is going to create greater disparity and all those type of things. And that's true to a degree. Having said that, we also have to think about the numbers that we're talking about here. There's a couple things to consider. And I'm going to do some very, very rough math as we kind of get into this conversation because it needs to be discussed um, kind of, you know, what's going, what's going on here. So when you look at the current format, the Big Ten and the SEC, if they're going to get 58% of $1.3 billion, that's still a lot of money. And it's, it, 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 I mean, they're going to get a ton of money. But if you look at what's going to happen for the other leagues, I'm trying to do this here. So that's, um, if you look at where they were, where they're talking about. So let's say you get, you're talking about 32% of $1.3 billion. That is still, if my math is correct, I believe $416 million. You divide that by two. I mean, that's that's more than what that's almost what they were. The whole thing was before. That's still going to be two hundred and eight million dollars per league. So that's, I believe, annual. That's still two hundred eight million dollars. Before, when it was four hundred sixty million, it was and divided by five leagues. Let's just say it was split up evenly. The the it was really only nine point. No, nah, that's not correct. Let me see here real quick. It was 460 million. I'm trying to do this on a calculator on my, com- on my computer, and it's not great. So let's say it was divided by five. Each league was basically getting um, $92 million, right? Is that is that right? So 92 times five, about $90 million. Yeah, it's about $92 million. 
for each league. So even though that money is being redistributed unevenly, the, these these conferences are still getting twice as much money. Here's the other part. The leagues are going to be smaller. So when you look at the Big Ten, the Big Ten is going to be making, let's do the math again, and I'm going to try to get this right the first time. Two, three, one, two, three. So the Big Ten is going to be getting 700 and, or excuse me, oh, did that wrong. I'm going to try to get this correct. So it's times 0.58 divided by 2. The Big Ten is going to be getting $377 million. So that's over 100 and it's about $169 more million. Okay. And that's going to be split up between 18 teams. Okay. So that's, what is it? If you just talk about that, it's like basically about like 20 million, about 20 million per team. Am I correct on that? Somebody in there and they're doing math better than I can. Where you look at the 208 million that the big that the ACC is getting, and you divide that by 15 schools, and they're getting about 13.9 million now. Before those 15 teams were getting, if you divided up the the 92 million, they were all getting about 6.1 million. Okay, so. When you when you look at it, they're making these smaller these these ACC and Big Twelve are still going to make a ton of money. So while the benefit, while the SECs, you say, well, they're they're going to be the, the the better thing. Like the reality is, is okay, but how do you spend your money? I, I think it's a joke. I think it's an absolute joke that the SEC and the Big Ten are are, are going to get more. I, I get it, but at this point in time, you have to look at the raw numbers and not the percentages. And you look at these ACC schools who were in the past, the conferences were getting $92 million, the Big 12 and the ACC. Now they're getting $218 million, and they're not expanding as fast as those other leagues. So they're splitting that money between fewer schools, which means they're going to get a greater percentage of that pie than the school. The leagues are going to have 18 and, and 20. And so to me, when I look at this, yes, it's – it's creating somewhat of a disadvantage, but again, it's still this new contract is going to help these other schools a ton. You are not going to be able to use an excuse that you don't have enough money to get your, um, you know, your your new facilities and to hire the coaches you want and all these kind of things. You're still going to have that money. It's about how smart are you with it. And so, I don't think this is the the death of those leagues that people think. For Notre Dame, for example, and, and I'll read you what Ross wrote in here. Uh, about this com about this whole thing about what he said about Notre Dame. Just if you just give me one second, I'm gonna. So here's what he said um, about Notre Dame. Let me go here. So he said Notre Dame. Let's see here. And Heather Dennis has reported that uh, the three power Big Ten, ACC, Big Twelve are all approved of this. Notre Dame is approved of this. And uh, they're just waiting on the SEC. So this is what it says. It said the Big 12 and ACC are set to see a doubling of their previous amounts, which I just talked about. Notre Dame is expected to receive its own annual distribution that is expected to increase significantly from its current distribution. And this is the thing, too, that helps Notre Dame. Everybody looks at it and says, well, this league is getting this much, but Notre Dame's only getting this small amount. They're only getting, you know, X number of dollars. When in reality, if you look at what Notre Dame is getting, a lot of times it's as much, if not more, than what's going to the specific, the, the, the leagues. I'm not sure how it, it goes to the teams that are in the playoff, but basically the money you get, you split between all your leagues. Now, one thing that Florida State has tried to advocate for is that when they get that money, they think they should deserve a greater piece of that. That's something that the leagues have to figure out. Does Vanderbilt get as much as Alabama? That's something that the leagues have to decide, and every league is going to be different. But for the ACC, you now have a lot more money coming in to really say, "Hey, listen, you know, you know, Pitt, BC, you're only going to get this amount because you know Florida State and Clemson are going to get this. And if you want to make more, then you go get to the playoff because if you get to the playoff, you're going to make more. So you could say something like, where the ACC and the Big Twelve now have a little bit more incentive to say, "Hey, listen, you know, best teams in our league don't go to the Big Ten, don't go to the ACC because we're going to create a structure." where the top three or four teams in the league get a higher payout every year. 
I think we're going to see something like that. We've heard this isn't me coming up with this. This is me, you know, reading about these different things. I think that ultimately is going to be if Florida State stays, it'll be that kind of settlement. Now that these numbers are figured out, the ACC can go back to Florida State and say, hey, listen, you stay here. We'll make sure if you're in the top four, you get this amount, which is going to put you on par with what the SEC or the Big Ten is going to pay you for their payout. Yes, the TV revenue is not as much, but we're going to give you a lot more money, which means your budgets are going to start getting met more because that's where Florida State's struggling. So it, it, it doesn't mean that Florida State's going to still say yes, but it gives the ACC more ammo to say, hey, listen, here's how we're going to structure this. We're going to help you out. This is how we're going to do it. And, and so I think that while this is obviously an unfair thing, I don't, I don't like it. I talked about the lack of equity yesterday. I'm, a, I'm not a fan of equity when it comes to things involving like merit. I'm not a, you know, I think equity uh, needs to be properly understood. If we're talking about like equity between, you know, a, a men's program and a women's program, you can't say the women deserve as much as the men when the women are producing way, 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 way less revenue. So I don't like it in that regard. But in something like this, where you're all part of the same sport, you're all part of the same thing when it comes to like TV revenue, playoff revenue, I think there should be a level of equity to where, you know, the leagues get a certain amount. Like you could figure it out to where, you know, the percentage of teams that you have in the playoff, you know, you get a certain amount. You could do things like that if you're if your conference is better. But I think in this type of instance, while I dislike the lack of equity in the TV contracts and I dislike the lack of equity in this particular contract, you also can't deny that when you look at the raw numbers, this is still going to be something that helps the ACC and the Big 12. This is still going to provide them with a huge revenue boost. And when you look at it for Notre Dame, so how does it affect Notre Dame specifically? Well, in the next two, three years, Notre Dame is going to see a huge windfall of cash. And it's in threefold. Number one, the smallest one is the new apparel deal with Under Armour, re-signing with Under Armour, which I believe kicks in this year. They're obviously going to get a little bit more from that. The second one is the new TV contract extension with NBC. Now, we don't know what those numbers are. I've heard anywhere from 30 to 50 million. Let's just cut cut it right in the middle and say it's 40 million. Okay. Let's say that Notre Dame was previously making, when you look at the ACC and, and the deal with the ACC and NBC, Notre Dame was making around 26 ish. That's a rough number. It could be like 27, 28. I've heard as high as that. 26 to 28 million dollars a year on their TV deals. If we cut the rumors that I've heard in the middle, so not 30, not 50, but right in the middle, you're talking about now Notre Dame all of a sudden with the with the ESPN contract is now making closer to 56 to $58 million. That's at least, at least double the TV revenue that they were making per year, at least double. It's not a shock that after these deals are signed, Notre Dame is now throwing money out at assistant coaches because they understand We've got more money to spend. Now we can invest it in making sure these programs are better. It's not a coincidence that they went out and made the investment with the, the basketball program and those type of things because they know this money's coming. Now you're talking about the previous college football playoff deal was get, paying out $460 million a year. Now it's paying out $1.3 billion a year. Notre Dame's going to see another windfall because they're going to make more every year from that because they don't have to be in the playoff to get the revenue from it then all of a sudden you're seeing Notre Dame is make is going to see a huge, huge increase in revenue coming into the program, which should certainly help them out quite a bit. Finally, I want to talk again about the format. The good thing about this is I'm not a fan of going to a 14-team playoff. That's, I think that's silly. I think 12 is as much as I was one to go with, but whatever. It's going to be 14 now. The good news is, is it's going to still likely stay. I mean, I'm curious what to see with the, the the buyout, or excuse me, the um, uh, the the automatic qualifiers. From what I read, I believe Ross reported, it's still going to be five to nine, and and um, uh, five to nine is going to be five automatic bids, and then nine um, at large bids. So for Notre Dame, it still helps them a ton. Notre Dame still can't get a first round buy. I don't know what the makeup is going to be. I'm going to have to read further into what Ross is reporting. I may reach out to him. Uh, I've talked to him a few times. Re really nice guy, hard worker. But uh, and find out kind of what the buy situation is going to look like. He may have reported. I just haven't seen it yet. But I, I'll say again, 
folks, the buy for Notre Dame is uh, not having a buy for Notre Dame is 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 okay because in most years that's going to result in round one Notre Dame playing a lower seed than they would play if they were the let's say they're the number one seed and they get a buy in a fourteen team playoff depending on you know how many buys you get you probably get what let's just say you get I don't know, six buys or something, double buys, whatever. You're going to play something around an 8-9 seed, you know, 7-10 seed, something along those lines. Where now you're going to play a 12. Let's start the 12 team playoff. You're going to play a 12 if it whereas before you'd have played the winner of 8-9 in your first game. Your second round game, you're going to be playing the 4 seed, but if Notre Dame was worthy of a 1, 2 or 3 seed, that means that second round game is going to be against a team that was ranked lower than Notre Dame going into that final seeding process as opposed to you know playing a, an 8 9 game a higher seed in your first game then playing a semifinal game against the 2 3 4 seed along those lines. So this actually opens up an even better path than Notre Dame for Notre Dame in this regard. I'm not sure what it's going to look like with the 5 and 9. But I would imagine based on some of the things I have seen floated around that it's still going to be something to where Notre Dame is going to benefit from it. The path if they are worthy of a top four seed otherwise, this still creates a very good path for them because of the way that it's going to shake out. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. But for the next two years, if Notre Dame is good enough to have a top four seed under the previous rules, they're going to actually have an easier path being the five seed. You get a home game in December against the 12 seed. You're then going to play in round two, the four seed, who will definitely be a team that's ranked behind you if you were a top four seed or if you were a top four team, that means the seed that's number four would have been a team ranked lower than you. So it's not going to be until round three, the semifinals, that Notre Dame has any chance of playing a team ranked higher than them if they are would have otherwise been a top four seed. So it actually opens up pretty well for them. And I, I think they're going to be okay. They've made it look, like I said, Jack Swarbrick had to give up something to get something. And he's not an idiot. He, he did the math, and he understood, okay, what does a five seed look like? Okay, revenue from having a home game, right? We don't have as much time off after the end of our season because we don't play a conference championship game. This allows us to still be competitive and not – this is what we're sacrificing to not join a conference. But I guarantee you he did the same math I did where he looks at it and says, okay, it's the five seed. This is who we play in round one at home, and that means in round two, the quarters – we're going to play a team that that jumped us in seeding but was actually ranked lower than us. So you, you like to think that this is a team we're better than. So this actually works out pretty good for Notre Dame, and uh, I, I think it does. Now I'm curious to see what it looks like in the 5-14 to 14 format. We'll find that out. So that's going to do it for today's show, everybody. We can continue this conversation on the message boards at boards on our irishbreakdown.com. I have a, a, a mailbag on the board, a written mailbag, so you can throw in any questions you want if you have follow-up questions about this or any other topics we had, you can go to boards.irishbreakdown.com and check that out. You can definitely have a very fun conversation about that kind of stuff at boards.irishbreakdown.com. On your way out, folks, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share this podcast, give us a five-star review. We'd greatly appreciate that. And we will talk to you again very, very soon on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.